Today is Saturday, July 25th, 2009. We are interviewing Thomas S. Flanagan. Um, Mr. Flanagan is 84 years old, having been born on April 4th, 1925. My name is Fletcher McManus, and I will be conducting the interview with my dad, John McManus. The interview is being conducted by the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Um, which branch of service did you serve in? I was in the Army uh, Quartermaster Corps. Okay. Um, what was your highest rank? My highest rank was Sergeant. Okay. Where did you serve? I served in uh, uh, the European Theater, beginning in England, and then going from there to France, and from France to uh, Germany, and Belgium, and so forth. Okay. Where and when were you born? I was born in Bangor, Maine, in 1925. What did your parents do for a living? Well, my parents, my um, mother, was a mother. She was a homemaker. And my, uh, although before that, uh, before she was married, she was working for the telephone company and her, her uh, job was to do something that's done automatically now, that is to charge people for long distance calls <laughs> by the minute, <laughs> <laughs> writing it down. And my father was uh, originally a uh, a newspaper reporter, uh, beginning when he was in college in uh, 19, uh, 1910, I guess it was, and, and uh, uh, he uh, volunteered for the Army in 1918. He was not subject to the draft because he had two children at that time, so he was exempt from the draft, but he thought he ought to do it, so he uh, uh, was in the Army for a very short time, maybe uh, a month or so, when uh, it was to, uh, he, was, he was discharged. Honor, honorably from the army, and he came back to Bangor, Maine, where he was had been a newspaper reporter. And uh, by that time, unlike today, if he, that happened today, the employer would have to take him back. But in those days, they said we don't have the job anymore. So then he uh, <coughs> applied for a job with the uh, United States government and became a income tax. Uh, Person. Yeah, so he was in, the, that's what he did for the rest of his life. Did you have any brothers or sisters? I did, yes. I had uh, seven brothers and sisters. Yeah. One of them was your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> did, it, did anybody else in your family serve in the military? Yes. Uh, I had three brothers. So four of us were all in the military. Okay. Um, okay. Um, of what were the services of like what branch of service were your brothers in? Okay. Well, I go on to explain to you that uh, my oldest brother was uh, actually he went into the navy in 1942. And he had uh, worked previously as an electrical engineer. And so he was commissioned in the, in the uh, Navy and uh, was sent to uh, uh, Harvard for a course in something brand new at that time. That was radar. And uh, he went to the uh, South Pacific and was uh, radar officer for uh, a PT boat squadron. And uh, uh, 
the next one was my brother Charlie, who was uh, actually um, he uh, he was uh, got his draft notice in November of, uh, of 1942, and he was at that time in the middle of his sophomore year at the University of Maine. And the people at uh, the University of Maine said, well, if you, if you join the Army Reserve, then you will, you can stay out of the Army until June when you finish your sophomore year. So uh, his uh, career then took him to, uh, after basic training in the infantry, he went to uh, uh, what was then called Virginia Polytech VPI, which is now Virginia Tech. And there he completed his course as a civil engineer, and he uh, uh, was expecting to go to uh, the Corps of Engineering uh, Officer Training School, and instead of that, all of his, he and all of his friends were sent to the infantry. And from the infantry, he went down the south in Alabama and so forth and got more infantry training. And then he uh, went to Europe in, uh, in uh, 1944. His unit went directly to the front line, and this was uh, <coughs> when the, the uh, enemy was putting up its greatest um, um, effort to keep people out of, because this is their homeland they were protecting, you know. It wasn't like they were being pushed back like they were in France and so forth, but this was it, and they fought fiercely and uh, unfortunately he lost his life there by machine gun fire uh, um, outside of a uh, what they call a pill box which is a, uh, a rounded uh, hut you might say but a big hut and, uh, and there were guns inside and there were some heroic, heroic things. You couldn't, you couldn't get them. The Germans had put, uh, really put together a good defense, uh, and uh, this is one of the things on the on the line was uh, on the on the border of Germany with Holland, and they, they had uh, these big places with to keep people back, you know. Oh, the marginal, marginal line, and uh, it was pretty impossible to get through there. And as a matter of fact, at the time his division was attached to the British Army, and this was in November. It was cold and wet, and awfully bad conditions, and. Uh, <coughs> uh, what I have read is that the American army was supposed to be supported by artillery, by the Germans, and, and, and um, uh, uh, by the by the English. I mean, and the English tanks could not get through them; they were bogged down in the mud. So the infantry went alone to do this job. And, it was very, very, very bad. The same month in 1943, and uh, uh, what I did was uh, I uh, was assigned to the quartermaster corps, and, and I went to uh, truck driving school, uh, mechanic school. Then I went to Europe, and. Uh, I, um, 
was was assigned there to a replacement depot. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the whole thing about what I went to in the in the, uh, the quartermaster corps was basically I went to a uh, quartermaster replacement depot. Uh, Replacement training center, replacement training center in uh, uh, Petersburg, Virginia. Yeah. Where did you first go, and how did you get there? Where? Did I? Mm -hmm. Like. Yeah. The war. Okay. And tell me about when you first joined the army and what it was like. Describe the training you received. When I went into the army, what was it like? Yeah. And what training, and describe the training that you received. Oh, well, <clears throat> I uh, went into basic training and uh, first of all, the, 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 <clears throat> the procedure at that time was that you first go to a receiving uh, place, and that was in, uh, uh, that was in uh, Massachusetts, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and uh, there people uh, get shots, tetanus shots and all of that, and they get dog tags, and they get examinations, and they get uh, uh, written examinations about how much they know and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, then the procedure is there, if, that, again, if they need people in Colorado, then they pick the ones out and send them out. And it's supposed to be there a very short time. And so uh, it was just to get uniforms and, and uh, yeah. I'll tell you a little story about uniforms. I went to the supply room to get a, to get a uh, uniform, which included a, an olive drab uh, overcoat. And uh, the person who was handing out the overcoats gave me a coat, and I thought I liked it fine. And uh, there was a first sergeant there from the, uh, uh, from the, who had been in World War I, and they put him in charge of overcoats. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he took it back to the guy that gave it to me and said, give him a bigger coat. That boy ain't done growing yet. <laughs> now I was 18 years old. That's what his opinion was. However, I like the first one better. Where did you train? Then I went to uh, Camp Way, Virginia. And this is what it was like. In those days, they put you on a train and they didn't tell you where you were going. Just go, just follow the orders. Never mind where you're going. So, uh, I got on a train from Massachusetts and the following day it arrived in Virginia. <laughs> a lot of shifting around and it was only for, the, the, the train was only for soldiers, you know. You couldn't get on it if you wanted to with a ticket. And so then I went to uh, Camp Lee, Virginia and had uh, basic training which included uh, marksmanship and walking and walking and walking and washing dishes on KP and uh, one thing or another. And then when I finished the basic training then I was sent to uh, the driving school because I knew how to drive. And in and, and the Quartermaster Corps, they had the different divisions, like they had people who were learning to be cooks and bankers, 
and they had people uh, uh, doing uh, various things to support the infantry and artillery and so forth. It's after training? Yeah. I went to uh, a place in uh, Pennsylvania and now I've forgotten what the name of the, of the camp was or anything, but it was, was near Sharon, Pennsylvania and this was a, uh, again, it was sort of a warehouse for soldiers. In other words, uh, you went there and if somebody needed this kind of people with, with this kind of background and they would take you in their outfit, you know. Uh, it was called a replacement depot. And the more popular, it was called Rappel Depot. <laughs> and uh, so I went from right there to uh, uh, a uh, staging area in uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts called Camp Miles Standish. And uh, I was there only a short time. And then, I'll give you an illustration of what it was like in the Army. This is a very short distance from Boston. I would guess not more than 25 miles. So, uh, we, got, we got up in the morning at 2 o'clock and had breakfast. Then we went down to the railroad station and waited and waited and waited. And at 7 o'clock, we started on the train trip to Boston and went to the Boston Fish Pier, so-called. And that's where we got on the ship to go to. We didn't know where it was going. But we figured it must be in the European theater. <laughs> What campaigns did you participate in? Well, uh, I had uh, battle stars for uh, Normandy and Northern Europe. Two, two stars. Mm. What countries did you go to? Well, I went first to Normandy. And uh, later to uh, Germany and did, Belgium. Did you ever interact or talk with the enemy? Uh, Uh, the only thing I can say about that is that, uh, of course, all Germans were enemy, right? And, uh, yeah, I'll, tell you, I'll say that uh, um, I had some interaction with uh, German prisoners of war, you know, because... Uh, Did you get to know people in Europe? Yes. I, I knew some uh, nice people there, mostly in France. Can you describe some of your most memorable moments in the war? It's hard to describe my most memorable moments, but uh, I can tell you that uh, the worst thing about the war, as far as I'm concerned, was that it was a tough living. And I mean by that that uh, the food wasn't too great and uh, there was long walks and uh, just, you know, not having showers and living in the same clothes for weeks. And it, was, it was just inconvenient. What kind of foods did you get? The food was not too good. 
the, the cook seemed to be not great. <laughs> and I don't know what they got had to start with, but the, the rations were pretty good toward the end of the war because uh, they had, uh, we started in with uh, C and K rations. And, uh, K rations, as I remember, we boxes that you put in your pocket and they had uh, crackers and a piece of cheese and uh, a little packet to make coffee with and uh, that sort of thing. And then the uh, C rations, um, I mean the K rations, had a little can of meat or food or something like that. And, and then uh, Eventually, they got something called 10 and 1 rations, which were pretty good. And 10 and 1 was one box that would feed 10 people. And uh, those, those were, had additional things in there that were, that were okay. What medals did you receive and why? Uh, I received no medals and why because I didn't do anything <laughs> <laughs> how did you stay in touch with family and friends from home well the communication was not good at that time and we had uh, something called uh, V letters and what you did, you had a form and you wrote your name and address and the person you wanted to send the, and the address and so forth. And then you wrote on it what you, what you wanted to say. And this was filmed by the thousands. And they sent the film back to the United States. And they here they made a letter from it, you know, it looked like a photocopy, early photocopy. Yeah. And also, you could use, one of the things that was nice about it was that if you were there, you didn't put any stamps on it, you just wrote free on there in the, in the, in the corner, and, and uh, they sent the mail free to, for, for people in the service. Uh, but it was a very slow, slow process. What did you do when you were off duty? Well. <clears throat> We did have some, uh, uh, we go into town and make acquaintances with the local people and, and uh, in some areas in Normandy we could go to a restaurant because <clears throat> there were people starving in Paris but the, uh, Normandy was an agricultural area. And they had plenty of cows there, some of which were accidentally killed by machine gun fire. But <laughs> and there always seemed to be plenty of beef there, and you could get. And there was cheese there because the people made cheese, and the people made cider from apples. There's a lot of apples there, and uh, so. Uh, it was possible to go and uh, get a uh, pretty good dinner for a package of cigarettes, <laughs> swamping, you know, because they were very anxious to get cigarettes and soap, the, the civilian population. And, uh, and bread, they had uh, nice uh, bakeries there, boulangeries, and they, they had good good pastry and good food. Yeah. Who were your buddies and, or friends during the war? Well, uh, I actually had a uh, few close friends. I had a, a good friend who was a, who was a sergeant, sergeant Cooper from, from uh, South Carolina. And then uh, my lieutenant was a pretty good friend, and he's from, uh, he was from uh, 
His name was Olson, and he was from, uh, he's from Bo Boise, Idaho. And I had a friend named Passarelli from New Jersey. He was a good friend. Do you stay in touch with these friends? I, uh, well, Sergeant Cooper has been dead for a long time, but uh, uh, Lieutenant Olson, I do uh, communicate with him, and uh, Tony Passarelli, I communicate with him. Not often, but. And the other thing about it is that everything in World War II was top secret. Now, I think of one particular uh, case because I, I, this was so awful. But uh, on Christmas Eve of 1944, there was a Belgian ship that was transporting uh, half of an American division to Normandy. They were, not going to, they were going to, uh, was, uh, when I went to Normandy, uh, I arrived on the beach, you know. Uh, but by Christmas, we were well into the German border. And uh, uh, they were going to, uh, Cherbourg to offload. So uh, this was half of a division, American division, and, and uh, they uh, got to within five miles of Cherbourg when the ship was hit by a, a torpedo from a German submarine. And the ship sank very slowly, and the guys were up on the, on the deck waiting to be rescued. And uh, one ship happened to be in the area, and they picked up as many as they could. But and they were picking them up with team, but uh, hundreds of them drowned, just waiting there. They couldn't. And some of them died when they jumped into the water from the deck of the ship and they weren't trained in uh, life jackets and a lot of them just broke their neck when they, could, you know, they could But anyway, uh, this was a terrible disaster and a terrible thing to happen and the, it was said that the lifeboats were taken by the Belgian crew and who just left the scene. And uh, so they should have been rescued, number one. It shouldn't have happened. But uh, this was Christmas Eve, 1944. Nobody in the United States learned about this for 12 years when somebody talked about it. You know, it was a top secret. I don't know what's secret about it, but that's the way it was. Describe where you were when the war ended and how you felt. This is one of the things, that, one of my events that I, was outstanding in my memory still. But I was sent to, uh, from Belgium, I was sent down to uh, a staging area in the southern part of France. It was close to Marseille. And uh, from there, uh, we were supposed to go directly to the Pacific Theater because the war in Europe was over, but the Pacific War was still going strong. So uh, uh, I was there for a week or two, I guess, and and. Then came the atom bomb dropping on Japan, which ended the war completely. So I remember that vividly. Because one of the things I remember about it 
that uh, is that uh, there was a lot of celebrating going on, and by that time we had uh, had a what they call a uh, showdown inspection. Everybody was supposed to put everything they had out uh, in, uh, on, the, on the ground, and, and these people came around and said, "You can't take that," and so forth. And <coughs> So we were prohibited from taking enemy weapons with us. Well, I don't know what happened, but when it was announced that the war was over, then these people, some of them went on a real wild rampage and they were shooting up, <laughs> shooting the tents and so forth, and uh, it was kind of scary. Uh, Tell me what you did after the war. Uh, okay, uh, this was one of the great things about the war with me was that uh, uh, because of uh, something called the GI Bill, then uh, I was able to go to college and uh, the government paid um, for books and tuition, and uh, then we got a big paycheck besides, which was sixty dollars a month, two dollars a day. <laughs> so eventually, I got married, and when I got married, the uh, uh, monthly stipend went up to ninety dollars. So I got three dollars a day. So. Uh, I was going to college and I soon found out after I got married that three dollars a day didn't go very far. <laughs> so I had I, I got part-time jobs, you know, on the, on the school. How did your war experiences impact your life? Well, I guess, I guess that uh, uh, I would say that, you know, in the Army, they used to say you hurry up and wait. And sometimes, you know, if you, you might wait around for two days, to, waiting for something to happen. And so I guess you become more patient, you know. And uh, the other thing, I can tell you that uh, <coughs> what I ended up with is, and uh, I ended up with a <coughs> Graves Registration Company. <coughs> and the task of Graves Registration was to uh, <coughs> was to pick up the, cat the, the dead from the fields and take them back and, and make out the necessary papers so that the folks back home would know they are dead. And it was not a very pleasant job. The other thing was to identify some of them, you know, because what we had was two dog tags and uh, with the, all the information on it. And, uh, nobody ever told people. I don't know if you saw that movie called Saving Private Ryan. No. Uh, one of the things they show, one of the things they show in there is this, they were looking for Private Ryan and they go to the company commander and they get a whole stack of dog tags. Well, this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. They were supposed to uh, uh, put one dog tag with all the information with the body. The other one went to the uh, wooden cross that was put up above it, or Star of David, and, and that, but that didn't always work because it, it, it failed in some reasons. Nobody ever told you in basic training that what was supposed to happen to your dog tags if you didn't make it, you know. As a matter of fact, one of the things about uh, uh, this company that I was in, that they told people, you know, Get these bodies out of the way quickly so that the crew
groups coming in more wouldn't be able to see them, you know. So, but, um, you know what happened, but anyway, uh, <coughs> we uh, worked in cemeteries, and when I first went to Normandy, the, the graves were dug by French civilians, and they were paid for it. And later, we had so many German prisoners who had nothing to do then we uh, used German prisoners to dig the graves and so forth. And, and uh, they, as a matter of fact, in every one of these cemeteries, they had their own little office of, of uh, Germans who were working in the office to uh, do the paperwork for the Germans. So I, uh, we picked up more Germans than Americans, probably. And, and uh, they had their own, uh, their own they had a German cemetery and uh, just adjacent to it, uh, an American cemetery. And, um, uh, but what happened in many cases was that uh, a soldier would see his friend die and go and take his dog guys and put him in his pocket to take him. So that, because they didn't know what to do with him. You know? Then here was this guy who, God knows how to identify him, except that there were various ways. But, uh, for example, one of the things that they, they used to have uh, air crashes, you know, and the airplanes would burn up, and they'd, they'd find the engine going into the ground, you know, it was so heavy, and, and you could get numbers off that. Put, all, put the piece all together. I never was involved in solving the things, but I just tried to discover to my best man who, who, might, who this guy might be. And sometimes you get a guy with four or five different dog tags in his pocket. They were always at least with his friends. And the other thing, of course, is sometimes you didn't get there until a week later and it wasn't very pleasant. Right. But I was fortunate enough to, uh, I, I might just add this, that I was, uh, the French always seemed to know where the uh, American, where, where, the, where the dead were. And uh, I was fortunate in that I had studied French in high school. I wasn't especially good at it, but I, but I didn't. I wasn't especially good at it, but I was better than anybody else in my company. So I did some. Uh, I got some better jobs like that. With, in other words, I go up and, and investigate enough to find out where these people were and so forth. And and uh, uh, so I was saved some of the worst part of the job. <laughs> I gotta tell you this one story. <coughs> that, that when I first arrived in Normandy, I went, <coughs> I went out and I was supposed to go out and pick up these Germans who had been killed and and uh, it, I have to tell you that at that time, you know, uh, uh, we were, you might call them brainwashed, <laughs> about the evil enemies, you know, that we had, and uh, how terrible they are, and ferocious and awful, and, and uh, one of the first times I went out, I know there some guys in there, and we have been trained to do this too. That uh, we're supposed to, it was rumored that the enemy sometimes um, booby trapped their, their, their own dead. So when you went to pick them up, you get blown up, you know. So uh, we, we went out to this place and there were three young Germans in a machine gun place, and it was kind of a hole in the ground. And 
So this is what we're trained to do, is to tie a rope on them and get back and pull them out of the way to be sure they weren't booby trapped. So we had that. I never saw anything like that, but that's what they told us to do. So look down there. And here were these three kids who were probably 18 or 20. And they had nice green uniforms on. And they had a belt on. And the, or the belt buckle was a shiny. We wouldn't have this in our army because we didn't want shiny things. But it was nice. And uh, uh, on the belt buckle, it said, Gott mit uns, which is God be with us. And uh, I said, what is this? You know, this is the enemy, you know. And uh, so that kind of changed my thinking about the whole thing. What's this all about anyway? And, you know. But I felt bad. I, be I felt bad for the enemy, you know, because these are kids with families and so forth. And so <clears throat> that was one of the things that was outstanding in my memory.